Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. All right, my microphone's on. I'm off to a good start. Um, hi, my name is Jennifer Brzezinski. I'm a partner here at Venable in the Labor and Employment Group. Um, I have with me today uh, my colleague, Carl Masnick. Um, both Carl and I focus primarily on employment work, including counseling. We work with a broad variety of clients, including uh, probably half of my clients are, are nonprofits. So I'm really, we're really happy to be here um, to present to you today. Um, wanted to let you know that, and this is my message, um, due to high attendance, we will be holding questions from our webcast attendees until after the event. Uh, In-person questions are welcome. Um, please use the mics on either side of the room. If we don't get to your questions during the presentation, feel free to come up and ask us at the end, or feel free to email either one of us after the presentation. Our contact information is at the end of the, is at the last page of the handout there. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, it's a pleasure to be here to um, speak to you today and help you navigate the universe of employee leave in the District of Columbia. Um, so as if figuring out leave and benefit entitlements in the District of Columbia wasn't already confusing enough as it is, right? The District of Columbia has passed the DC Universal Paid Leave Act. Carl and I are going to be referring that, referring to it as the UPLA or as the act throughout the presentation. Um, the UPLA, to the extent you don't know, is going to be one of the most generous laws in the country. It provides up to a total of eight weeks of leave for parental, medical, or family reasons in a one-year period. In addition to the leave, the employee is also going to be entitled to paid benefits, which employers are going to pay through a payroll tax, and then the D.C. government will in turn pay the employee the ben those benefits. Um, it has got broad coverage, so it is applicable to most employers who have at least one employee in D.C., um, and that includes nonprofits as well. Um, as, as Carl and I are going to explain, you do have some time. It's great that you're here. Um, we want to help you understand the UPLA and its implications. And with that understanding, we're hoping we're going to give you enough time to consider what existing policies and practices you have in place. And maybe when you update your handbooks at the end of this year or next year, you want to consider the UPL implications and maybe revise some of your existing policies based on those implications that are going to come forward. Um, so with that, our agenda for today is, oh, excuse me, there we go. There we go. Um, the agenda for today is going to be, we're going to talk to you a little bit about what employers are covered under the UPLA, which employees are covered under the UPLA, what the covered employees' entitlements are going to be, as well as your obligations as covered employers. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the current status of the law and highlight for you two important dates that are going to be coming up that you're going to want to pay attention to. There also have been some recent administration as far as the benefits and some uh, developments with regard to the D.C. government has taken some action because they're preparing to start administering this, this, poly this uh, act. Um, and the most important piece, I think, of this presentation is really the interplay that the UPLA is going to have with existing leave policies, and that's going to be DCFMLA for some of you, FMLA, as well as parental leave policies. Maybe some of you have paid medical leave policies already in place, plus that um, DC paid sick leave that you have to provide in accordance with the DC Accrued Safe and Sick Leave Act. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the penalties for noncompliance, and then at the end just touch on ways that you can prepare as you approach these important dates moving forward. So here we go. So the current status of the act is this. It, the, the legislative history is it was introduced in October of 2015, so several years ago. So what happened is the D.C. Council actually passed the act, and then it sits in this, it passed by a nine to four vote. It sits in this congressional review period. After the congressional review period lapses and nothing happens, it becomes effective. It became effective almost two years ago, April 7th of 2017. So even though you actually 
actually don't have any obligations as of yet under the UPLA. The act has been effective for two years. Um, but here's your two important dates. Um, one is, as some of you might have already heard, um, July 1st of this year, the D.C. government is going to start excising a payroll tax to fund the, UP, the UPLA. Um, so that's going to be put into a fund, but then employee, eligible employees who are entitled to receive the benefits are not going to be able to start collecting the benefits or taking the leave until July 1st of 2020. So as I had mentioned, the D.C. government is prepping for the administration of this act. Um, so what it's done is under the D.C. Office of Employment Services, that's DOES, as we refer to it, um, DOES has created the um, Office of Paid Family Leave. Um, and that office is going to be responsible for collecting the payroll tax that I mentioned, administering leave benefits, investigating fraud, retaliation complaints, and hearing appeals. So they've got a big job to do. Um, they're all, the, they also have released the final tax regulations with regard to the UPLA. Um, and that, those regulations focus primarily upon um, independent contractors and self-employees the individual's ability to opt into the program. There's some, it, the regulations deal with um, penalties and non-compliance and the record keeping. Quite frankly, not the stuff we're really excited about. What Carl and I really want to see is how is the DC, got, what are the regs going to look like with regard to the administration of the leave? But that is supposed to be coming soon. And quite frankly, everything that we say here today is going to be subject to those regulations because at this point, all we have is that the actual language of the law. But those regulations are going to help us see, see and understand how we're going to go about administering um, these benefits in this leave. Um, also, unfortunately for employers, there were a couple proposed amendments to the UPLA that um, would have been a good idea for employers, um, but just haven't gained any traction. So one was actually to lower the payroll tax that, was, um, that the employers are going to be subject to. And the other was not only to lower the payroll tax, but it wouldn't be applicable to employers unless they had 50 or more employees. So kind of mirroring the federal FMLA. As I said, unfortunately, um, no joy on that one. So with regard to employer coverage, the threshold is low. It's, it's a two-part test. One, you just have to have at least one employee working in D.C. And you have to be paying D.C. unemployment insurance. So with regard to having an employee in D.C., that means if you are uh, an association that is based, let's say, in Virginia, in Maryland, and you have one remote employee, and he or she spends 50% of his or her time working from their home in the District of Columbia, you are going to be a covered employer. Um, with regard to employment, uh, the definition of employment under the U UPLA, it is a broad definition. So it's not going to only apply just to those employers who pay the payroll, but it looks to also employers who exercise control over wages or conditions of employment or hours. And what that really gets to in, in practicality is if you employ employees through a staffing agency, because you're exerting control over their hours or conditions of work, you're going to be in a joint employer relationship with those staffing agencies likely and thus being a covered employer. So that's not to say probably that you can't negotiate with a staffing agency to ensure that they're dealing with the benefits, right, with regard to the payroll tax and the like, but you wanna make sure that the employee that you have on board is actually receiving the leave that they're entitled to under the U UPLA. Um, now, there is no, like I said, it's, it's at least one or more employee in D.C., and you're a covered employer. Um, so we don't get that break for employers who have fewer than 20 employees in D.C. There is some slight flexibility with regard to employers that have less than 20 employees. Um, although you still have to provide the leave and the benefits, it's the act says you don't have to hold the job open for the entire period of time. 
Okay, sounds good, right? Sounds like a lot of flexibility. Okay, we have to give the eight weeks of leave under UPLA, but we don't have to hold the, hold the job open. However, it becomes a little interesting from the practical perspective because let's say an employee exercises their rights under the UPLA to take their eight weeks of leave, and then at the end, we don't have a job for them. Um, the employee can say, you've retaliated against me because I've exercised my UPLA rights. So in that situation, what we're, all we're gonna have to do is say, okay, what's the legitimate business reason that we was, what was the grounds for actually not holding that job open? And quite frankly, in some of the smaller associations with less than 20 employees, that, that's gonna be fairly easy to do. Um, there are exemptions, um, but unfortunately not too many. Uh, DC and federal government are exempt from the act, uh, as well as church-run organizations, but again, all other nonprofits are gonna be subject um, to, to the act. And then I wanna just make clear at the end of this, so let's, some of you may be saying, okay, well, Jennifer just said I'm a covered employer because I meet this criteria and I have employees in DC, but I, I have other paid leave benefits that I provide my employees. Can I opt out of this program? You can't. There's no opting out of the program. You have to pay the taxes, you have to provide the leave. So that's why we thought it was a great idea to get an early start on this, But because what you can do is amend your existing policies to which the employees aren't entitled to in the first place, and you can amend them to take into consideration the benefits and the leave that they're gonna be getting under the UPLA. With regard to employee eligibility, again, it's a two-fold test. Um, and the threshold is fairly low. The employee just has to be working for a covered employer, and they have to have a qualifying leave event. Um, with regard to employees who work for a covered employer, this, I mean, I'm hoping with the regs, maybe they'll put some crystallization on this, but right now, as it's written, there is no service length in order for an employee to take advantage of this benefit. So in theory, on day one, an employee can start working for you and they're entitled to these benefits. So it's not like DCFMLA where you have to have the thousand hours of work and have worked for the employer for a year, right? That's the service requirement. Right now there is no service requirement. And I can see that being very difficult for employers to administer. Also, what, what strikes us as a little odd is there's no residency requirement. So if you have employees who live in Virginia or Maryland, but they work for you in DC, those employees are still entitled to benefits under the UPLA. It doesn't matter where you live. You don't have to live in DC. It's only working in DC. Um, also, this not only applies to full-time and part-time employees, but it also applies to temporary employees. Again, hoping the regulations are going to clarify um, and hopefully be, um, a little favorable to employers when it comes out. Um, we mentioned that, um, that self-employed independent contractors can opt into the program. There's all these special enrollment requirements um, and the regs help with that on how to do that. Um, I mentioned that you have to have a qualifying leave event. Um, within the qualify, you must file for UPLA benefits within 90 days of the qualifying leave event. And the qualifying leave events are just generally, it's the birth or adoption of a child. It's gonna be to care for a family member with a serious health condition or to care for your own, the employee's serious health condition. So now we get to the good stuff. All right, what's, what's the benefits? What are the leave? This is the leave only. Um, Carl gets the pleasure of doing the numbers. I went to law school for a reason because I don't do numbers. So he's gonna do all the payroll tax stuff. Um, so I'm talking only about the leave at this point. Um, employees can take a total, okay? A total, so overarching, even though I'm gonna break this down into options, you get a total of eight weeks per year of UPLA leave. Okay, but you can do any combination of the following. So it's eight weeks of parental leave for the birth or adoption or legal guardianship of a child or the assumption of a legal guardianship of a child. Six weeks for family leave, um, and that is to care for the serious health condition of a, of a family member. And then two weeks 
for the employee's own serious health condition. It's interesting, because I had mentioned I am going to let Carl talk about the actual benefits that the employee is going to be receiving. But the way the U UPLA works is similar to short-term disability. There is a waiting period for benefits. So an employee, there is seven days that they have to wait. So it's not clear right now um, at, under the act whether the employee will begin leave on day one, have a seven day waiting period where it's unpaid and then the benefits will start week two. That's probably what's gonna happen, but it's not clear right now. Again, I think the regulation should, cl should clarify that. Um, and then, but in that period, it pr probably will work just like we do with short-term disability. Most short-term disability policies have a waiting period, so we just let the employee use sick leave or PTO during, during that um, elimination waiting period. Another thing that appears to be, I think is gonna be really challenging for a lot of my clients is the leave can be taken intermittently in increments of one day. Yes, I know. I, I, I'm hoping for clarification on that. And I really hope that that's favorable because I just see that being incredibly problematic from the operations perspective. I think it's ripe for abuse, quite frankly. Um, it just, I think, I think can be very problematic. So again, hoping for some favorable rights on that. Um, so again, the payroll tax is going to be collected by the DC government from covered employers. Um, and then you as employers are going to be giving the leave to the employees that I just outlined. Um, but there's, so there's no exchange of money with regard to UPLA benefits. It comes from the government directly to the employee and we're just the ones get, giving the leave. Okay, so I had mentioned that, again, in the combination of total of eight weeks of UPLA leave, you're going to get six weeks, up to six weeks, for the serious health condition of a family member. Family member is incredibly broad. Um, it includes biological, adopted, foster, step, legal ward, child of domestic partner children. It also includes, with regard to parents, not only biological and adoptive, foster, um, parent, um, parent-in-law, step-parent, um, family member also includes spouses, domestic partners, grandparents, and siblings. So this is a very, very, very broad definition of family member. With regard to that employee's serious health condition for which they can take, you know, two weeks or a family member's um, health serious health condition, it's the same definition that the DC FMLA uses. Um, so we don't have to reacquaint ourselves with a new, a new definition there. So um, physical or mental illness, injury or impairment, overnight stay in a hospital or hospice, or um, you know, continuing treatment or supervision with three days of consecutive incapacity. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Carl to tell you more about those numbers and the benefits. Thank you, Jen. All right, so as Jen said, I'm gonna cover the numbers. What exactly the employee's gonna get when they are on uh, UPLA leave? And to make this extra difficult for you guys, there's actually a typo in your handout that I'd like you guys to correct right now. The slide is correct. And if you uh, go to the second bullet point where it says 90% uh, of the average weekly wage, cross out average weekly wage, and actually put what it says here on the slide, 150% of the DC minimum wage. So just trying to make sure that you guys are paying attention. Um, so let me get into it. Assuming that the employee has now made the claim and assuming that the DC government has approved that claim, uh, they are going to be eligible for a wage replacement, which is going to depend on uh, both their uh, actual wage uh, as well as whether or not they fall into one of two categories. You're either going to fall into the category of uh, making between the minimum wage in D.C. and 150% of that minimum wage, or you're going to make over 150% of the minimum wage, uh, and then depending on which category you fall into, the calculation is going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to get, don't worry, I'm going to go into an example and hopefully we'll clarify that uh, a little bit. But 
So the first thing you should note off the top of your head is that when you draft your policy, uh, you will treat this uh, similar to unpaid leave. These are benefits that are paid by the D.C. government. These are not wage replacements that you are paying. Well, you're paying it through the payroll tax, but you're not actually paying them uh, leave like you would on a parental leave policy or PTO or what have you. Okay. And the second most important thing here is that no matter what the weekly wage replacement is going to be capped. It's going to be capped at $1,000 uh, per week. That, that will go up uh, proportionally starting in 2021 to adjust for inflation. But it's going to be roughly around $1,000 per week. That's the maximum. Okay, so let me get into the examples that will kind of calculate this out for you. First thing you need to know is that uh, the DC minimum wage, as of right now, is $13.25. Uh, that will go up again starting in July, uh, and then again a year later, it's going to go up to $15 as of right now. But taking what the minimum wage is right now, which is $13.25, 150% of that, which is where the threshold is, is $19.88, which I'm just going to round to 20 bucks for the purpose of this example to make life easier on all of us. All right, so say that you make $15. It's under that 150% threshold. It's less than 20. You're going to fall into the first category. If you make $15 an hour, you're going to get 90% of your average weekly wage. And so it's, the calculation there is fairly straightforward. It's $15 times 40 hours a week, right? So that's what, that's uh, 600 times 0.9, 90%, which comes out to about 500, which comes out to $540 per week. And that'd be your weekly wage replacement if you made $15 an hour, assuming the current minimum wage. Sure, sure, sure. It's $15 times 40 hours per week, right? Which comes out to 600. Multiply that by 0.9 for, for 90%, and that comes out to $540 per week. Now, that's the simple calculation. The harder example is if you make more than 150% threshold. So let's say you make $25 uh, an hour, or you make a salary that comes out to $25 an hour. You're going to get 90% of 20 bucks. 90% of whatever the 150% threshold is, which in this example is 20 bucks. Then on top of that, you're going to get 50% of whatever amount you make over that threshold. Okay, so to give you the example of $25 an hour, you're going to get uh, $25 times 40 hours, which comes out to, not great at math, 800. And then you're going to multiply that by, again, 0.9 for 90%. So 20 times 40 times 0.9 comes out to $720. In addition to that, you're going to take whatever is over the 150% threshold, which in this case is $5, right? So you're making 25. So $5 times 40 comes out to 100. I'm sorry, comes out to 200. And then times 0.5 for the 50% comes out to 100. You're going to add that to your 720, and you're going to end up getting $820 uh, in weekly uh, wage replacements. And if you guys are completely lost right now, don't worry, because it won't be you making the calculations. It'll be the D.C. government making the calculations, so nothing can go wrong. All right. All right. That's, that's my joke for the day. All right. So we've covered what the employee is going to get. Now we're going to go into what you as an association, as an organization, have to pay under the new law. And that is 0.62% of the wages of each covered employee under the Act. And as Jen already went into, that's going to be the vast majority of your employees. These contributions are going to go into the Universal Paid Leave Implementation Fund. And then when your covered employees make a claim, to the D.C. government, and assuming they get approved, they'll draw from that fund to get their weekly wage replacements. Uh, then the fund, the D.C. government will also use these funds to pay for administrative costs for administering the law. But that's where the money is going to come from. Now, uh, organizations with five or more employees are going to be required to register to use the online portal. 
and they're going to pay through the online portal. It's going to be very similar to your unemployment insurance portal, if you're familiar with that. Right? And it's also going to be the way that the D.C. government's going to uh, communicate with you. They'll send you notices that way, uh, summaries, uh, your quarterly wage reports, those sorts of things. So it's all going to be, uh, all your related documents are going to be on your online portal. Now, for those employers who don't uh, pay their uh, payroll tax, the penalties will be very similar to what an employer would face if they don't pay their unemployment insurance. So we're talking uh, here uh, interest uh, every month that you don't pay your contribution. We're talking uh, potentially up to a 10 percent uh, penalty on it. And then if you keep ignoring the D.C. government, uh, they can assess liens and uh, file a civil action to collect. So uh, the penalties are very similar with unemployment insurance uh, penalties, if you're familiar with those. Moving on to uh, discrimination and retaliation. Like any other or most other uh, legally mandated laws, you cannot interfere with or deny the leave uh, of a covered employee who has uh, been accepted, whose claim has been accepted by the D.C. government. So you can't say you can't take the leave and you can't interfere with their ability to take the leave. You can't retaliate against them. And so what does that mean? That obviously you can't terminate them, you can't discipline them, you can't suspend them, uh, you can't reduce their wages or benefits, you can't move them to another position or demote them. Uh, and it, it's a very broad definition of retaliation. You can't, um, you can't tell another employer that they took the leave, you can't uh, threaten to report them to immigration services, the list goes on and on, right? This is not exhaustive. Uh, it's a very broad retaliation uh, policy. The interesting thing about this law is for employers who have 20, uh, who have fewer than 20 employees, you're not uh, required to reinstate the employee like you would in DC FMLA and FMLA leave. You're not required to guarantee their job upon return from the leave. You still have to grant the leave, but you uh, don't have to give them their job back. And if you're wondering how this is going to play out with the retaliation policy, you and me both. It is very unclear. I wish I had a better answer for you. Uh, the regulations will hopefully address this discrepancy. But the, the idea is you can't interfere with or retaliate against the employee. You have to still grant them to leave. And then if you don't plan to reinstate them to their job, you would do that very, very carefully to make sure you don't interfere with their rights or otherwise retaliate against them, besides the obvious retaliation of not giving them their job back. All right. Notice requirements. So like all of these laws, there are new notice requirements on all uh, covered employers, which, as Jen pointed out, will be uh, the vast majority of uh, D.C. employers. You have to give a notice of the employee's rights uh, and uh, the circumstances under which they can take the leave, either upon hire or within 30 days of hire. Then again, every year after that, and any time you become aware of uh, a circumstance where the, you think the employee might need to leave. So it's very similar to FMLA leave. If you become aware of circumstances uh, that arise for the employee needing leave, you have to give them notice of their rights, that they can take the leave um, and, and everything that comes along with that. You must also post a notice in the workplace uh, with your other posters in a conspicuous place, uh, which will list all of these things. Uh, and then uh, one thing I have on here is if you distribute this by email, it would be a good idea for you to keep the uh, email receipts or sign acknowledgments or some other type of record showing that you have actually distributed uh, this notice requirement. So what exactly has to be in the notice? As I said, you have to give them uh, a summary of their rights under the the act under the law. And that's going to include the circumstances under which employees can take leave. Uh, you have to include the non-retaliation policy that I just went over. And for uh, employers with 20 or uh, fewer than 20 employees, you need to include a reminder 
that says uh, you are not guaranteed your job back upon return from the leave. So it gives you that uh, extra reminder. And there's also uh, procedures for uh, filing these complaints. Now, the good news is, is that form complaints, or form notices rather, will be available online from the mayor's office. So you don't have to draft your own uh, creative notice. You can just get it straight from uh, the, uh, the DC website. Um, and then uh, you have to also distribute these in the same language as provided by the mayor's office. So uh, depending on however many languages they end up releasing, they end up publishing, you have to distribute it in those languages, assuming that you have employees who speak that language. Okay. Employee notice to the employer. So you can draft a policy that's going to require the employee to give you notice that they want to take UPLA leave. And because there's a waiting period, um, it, that, that makes a lot of sense. So if the leave is foreseeable, uh, you can draft a policy that's going to require the employee to give you notice of at least 10 days in advance of their need for UPLA leave. If it's not foreseeable, however, uh, you have, the policy has to provide for notice, uh, oral notice, to take the leave at least uh, 48 hours with, uh, within the, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You have to provide oral notice of the intent to take the leave uh, prior to the start of your shift, prior to the start of your work or if there's an emergency that occurs within 48 hours of that emergency occurring, right? So if it's not foreseeable before you start work or within 48 hours of a potential emergency occurring. Okay. And finally, uh, record keeping requirements. So you generally have to keep all of the records uh, required under the act for three years. Uh, you have to maintain the confidentiality of records. Think medical records and uh, medical information, confidential information that employees might disclose for needing the, uh, to take this leave. Uh, and you have to make sure that uh, it's not subject to your uh, destruction policy, your, your auto deletion policy, your email policy, uh, all of those. Um, now, in terms of uh, the types of records that you actually have to preserve. You have to preserve your notices that you give pursuant to the leave, right? So if you give uh, an employee a notice of their rights and whatnot, uh, you have to preserve any requests that you get for leave and your disposition of those requests. So if an employee asks for leave and you uh, approve it or you deny it, um, and then, uh, or the DC government rather denies it, you have to keep track of that. Uh, and then also the length of leave taken as well as, and this is the most important one, any of the employees' wage records related uh, to their earnings, their rates, their tax information, social security information, all that stuff, records that you're probably already keeping anyways to comply with other laws, but you have to make sure you keep it for three years under this act as well. And finally, uh, you will be required to submit quarterly wage reports uh, through the online portal that I mentioned. Uh, every quarter, uh, it's going to be very similar to the quarterly reports that you submit for unemployment insurance, and that's going to have a lot of this information as well. You have to keep those for three years as well. Excuse me, if you're already re uh, registered for already filing appeals, does, um, will we, are we already registered? Because I get to participate in the DC seminar, and they said you must register, but we're already registered. You have to register separately for this act through the portal. Um, so it's, it's, if you're registered for unemployment insurance, it's not going to just automatically transfer you over, right? But they will provide a separate form for you. Right. Okay. And with that, we're going to move to the interplay, and Jen's going to start us off. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if your head is still spinning, I'm going to make it spin a little bit more. Because um, we're going to start to talk about 
the interplay between the benefits entitlements under the UPLA and our, the existing leave laws, whether they be paid or unpaid, as well as some of your current policies. And if you think about it, there's a lot to consider here. Um, so we're going to talk about FMLA, if you have 50 or more employees. Um, if you have 20 or more employees in D.C., D.C. FMLA. Um, you've got the D.C. Accrued Safe and Sick Leave Act, right, that you get a, give your employees paid sick leave. You need to think about any paid parental leave policies that are in place. Um, also, the Americans with Disabilities Act, don't forget, because an unpaid leave of absence can be a reasonable accommodation. Um, also, we're going to talk about what is the eligibility for the employee if they are receiving unemployment benefits long-term disability benefits, and short-term disability benefits. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and talk about DC FMLA. So um, those of you who have under 20 employees can kind of take a little nap, and I'm going to run through these fairly quickly because if you're already subject to DC FMLA, you already know um, it, your obligations under it. Um, so again, a DC FMLA is only a leave entitlement, right? There is no wage replacement. It is unpaid leave. Um, it applies to employers with 20 or more employees in DC. Um, and those covered employees, those eligible employees, get 16 weeks of medical leave and 16 weeks of family leave in a 24-month period, right? Very, very generous, again, but it's only unpaid leave. So if they don't use any leave, you know, the, if they don't take advantage of the leave to which they're entitled to, when they're separated, there's no payout, right? There's no financial implications from it. To be eligible, um, as you know, you've got to have worked for an employer for 12 months continuous service. That's that service requirement I was talking about. Um, you also have to have worked for at least 1,000 hours in the 12-month period prior to the beginning of the leave, right? Um, the interesting thing about that is you get to count in that 1,000 hours any paid leave that your employer provides to you. So that's any PTO, vacation, or sick leave, right? That goes toward the 1,000 hours. That's different than federal. Um, again, you get the medical leave for the your own serious health condition or to care for a family member's serious health condition. That can be taken in um, either intermittently or in blocks of time. Um, and then with regard to that family leave, that you can, for the bonding of the child, for the birth or a bonding for, with the child, you can, employers can require their employees to take that bonding leave in a single chunk of time. That, the employer has the option of allowing them to do that intermittently or not. Um, and under DC FMLA, you can't force your employees to take any accrued, unused paid leave that they might have in the bank while taking DC FMLA. Of course, they can choose to elect to use that paid leave, and quite frankly, most of them do. I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen a situation where an employee doesn't want to use their PTO during their DC FMLA. But again, it is the employee's choice. The employer cannot force them to do so. FMLA, that's the federal. For those of you who have 50 or more employees, again, it's that leave entitlement, and you don't get any wage replacement. There's no monetary benefits associated with federal FMLA leave. Um, 50 or more employees, right? Um, and in a 12-month period, an employer has to provide 12 months, I'm sorry, 12 weeks of family and medical leave combined. So it's a lot less generous, quite frankly, than what we have here in DC. Um, and again, because there is no monetary benefits associated with federal FMLA leave, there is no payout for any unused leave upon separation. Federal FMLA, three, three requirements for eligibility. Um, you have to have worked for your employer, again, the service period, right, for at least 12 months. It doesn't have to be consecutive, though. Um, you have to have worked for at least 1,250 hours in the 12-month period preceding the leave, and you must be employed at a site in which 50 or more employees are employed in a 75-mile radius. So if you have satellite offices, uh, oftentimes you're um, employees, even if you have 50 or more employees, those employees won't be eligible because they don't meet that third criteria. Um, again, just like DC FMLA, uh, employees 
own serious health condition or care of a family member with their own serious health condition can be taken in a block of time or intermittently. Um, but with regard to the birth of a child slash bonding time, the employer can require the employee to take it in a single chunk. Um, again, unlike uh, DC FMLA, the employer can require the employee to use any accrued paid leave during that FMLA, so it runs concurrently. They're not allowed to take federal FMLA um, unpaid if, if the employer elects to do so. So what is the, um, what's the interplay now between these three laws? So the good news is UPLA leave just runs concurrently with your DC FMLA slash FMLA obligations. So that, that makes it easy. So day one, all three are going to start to run. So that makes it very, very easy. So it's not like you can take 12 weeks of leave under federal FMLA and then get an additional 12, I'm sorry, eight, eight weeks um, on top of that for U, UPLA leave. Um, but again, the UPLA is gonna be more generous, right? We've got it applying to employers with fewer than 20 employees in DC, um, where, you know, DC FMLA, you have to have 20 or more in DC. Uh, it, it also is going to apply, there's no service requirement, right? So it's going to start immediately. Eligibility starts immediately upon hire. Um, and applies to part-time employees as well as temporary employees. That's gonna be super interesting to administer. Um, however, UPLA doesn't provide any additional job protections beyond what the federal FMLA or DC FMLA provide, right? It's just you get your job at, at the end and you have to return to it. Um, again, for the fewer than employers with fewer than 20 employees, you don't have to reinstate. Um, so it's you got you have some more flexibility there. And now I'm going to turn it over to Carl to talk a little bit about uh, DC accrued safe and sick leave act. All right. So as you know, uh, DC also has its own paid sick leave law, and this law applies to every DC employer. Uh, it's very broad, and it, it applies. It covers uh, the vast majority, if not all, of your employees. Um, your employees can take DC sick leave for their own medical condition, uh, for uh, the family member's illness or medical condition, for their doctor's appointments. Um, and for absences associated with uh, domestic violence, sexual abuse, and stalking. Uh, one thing that's important to note about this law, a lot of clients don't get, is that this law does apply to part-time, temporary, and seasonal employees. As I said, it covers the vast majority of uh, DC uh, workers. Uh, the good news about this law is that uh, while it is paid sick leave, you do not have to pay out DC uh, sick leave upon separation of employment. You don't have to pay employees for any unused leave that they still have in the bank uh, when they leave. Um, and lastly, I'll note that employees uh, can use this leave uh, as it accrues very quickly after, uh, although it starts accruing on day one, they can use it after 90 days of employment. And so here are the accrual uh, rates. So as I mentioned, it accrues uh, over time worked. And how much accrues uh, or how much is required by law to accrue, your policy can always be more generous. But the minimums are going to depend on the size of your organization. If you're a smaller employer, then you're going to need to offer uh, about three days of paid sick leave per year, which accrue about one hour of paid sick leave for, a, uh, for every 87 hours worked, and it goes up. Uh, the bigger you are, the more leave you have to provide. Uh, an important note is that this leave does have to carry over into the next year. So uh, while you can cap the amount of leave that can be taken uh, at the annual minimum per year, you still have to carry over any accrued but unused sick leave into the next year. And so that's an important point that a lot of employers uh, tend to miss. Okay, so now we get into the interplay. How does this affect UPLA leave? And it's 
going to be in addition to any UPLA leave. And so what does that mean? It's going to mean that if you need to take leave for a medical reason, and that reason doesn't rise to the level of a serious health condition, so say like just a doctor's appointment, or you need a day to be home because you have the cold, or something uh, that's not a serious health condition, you're going to take your DC paid sick leave, right? UPLA leave is not going to be available. It's only available if, if you have a serious health condition. If, however, you need to take leave for a serious health condition, the employee is more than likely going to have to make a choice. Do they take their accrued sick leave? Do they take or, and apply for UPLA leave? Um, uh, and I say likely because the statute is unclear on this point. We're still hoping the regulations will make that clear. But more than likely, you're not going to be able to offset each other. You're not going to be able to say, I took uh, sick leave, and that's going to count against your UPLA allotment, or vice versa. Right? They're going to be in addition to each other. Um, Another thing, another point that I wanted to point out is, and Jen already mentioned this, is because of the waiting period, because of the procedural uh, safeguards, you're going to be waiting around while you need leave. And during that time, uh, you'll probably be wanting to use paid uh, sick leave. And it's a good idea uh, to uh, use paid sick leave while your uh, claim is pending, while you're, being, while you're getting approved. So because of the same reason, practically speaking, it's probably going to play out that for minor um, health conditions, minor situations, you, employees are going to tend to use their paid sick leave. And for more serious conditions, uh, they're going to take blocks of UPLA leave because it's going to be unlikely they're going to sit around for seven days while their claim is pending to take UPLA leave for uh, a small, uh, for, for a day or, or two days at a time. So as Jen mentioned, even though it is possible to take intermittent UPLA leave, that seven-day uh, waiting period is something to take into consideration. Okay. Now we get to the interplay between other types of paid leave that your organization may offer. And I'd like to start this off by saying that, uh, as a general matter, if your organization offers paid leave that's not put conditions on it, uh, and you can amend it as you see fit, uh, if that leave is not mandated by law, like, for example, uh, vacation or PTO or paid parental leave. Um, so what this is going to mean is if you offer, if your organization currently offers some form of paid parental leave or, say, some form of paid medical leave, you're going to be able to draft your policy so that it runs concurrently with UPLA leave, right? They don't get to uh, double dip. They don't get to take UPLA leave and then take paid parental leave under your policy. However, you have to make sure that your written policies don't interfere with or restrict an employee's ability to take UPLA leave. So most importantly, this means just because you have a paid parental leave policy doesn't mean you're going to be exempt from UPLA leave. You still have to provide that leave, grant that leave. You still have to pay the tax. Um, you can always uh, amend your own policies, but you have to make sure those policies don't interfere with employees' rights under the Act. That's also going to mean that you have to be careful with imposing restrictions on your PLA leave. So, for example, you're not going to be able to say, well, you have to use all your vacation or PTO before you can take your PLA leave. Um, and, and you're going to have to, uh, well, you can always implement a policy that's more generous than what's uh, permitted by law, so you can always say uh, our policies are in addition to UPLA leave, but you can't interfere with your obligations under the law. So one of the situations where this might come up, uh, it's something that you may want to think about, is will you let your employees gross up their uh, wage replacement benefits through your paid uh, leave policies, through your PTO or through your paid parental leave? And this is what I mean by gross up. They're going to get, uh, say they get 90% of their weekly wages from the D.C. government. Can they then take their accrued uh, PTO or, or vacation or whatever it is and get the extra 10% on top of that, right? So they would be taking PTO or paid leave while they're out on UPLA leave. Uh, if um, you want, you should be able to draft your own policies to give employees the option to do that.
As I mentioned, the Act, UPLA, doesn't limit the rights that employees get under other statutes, right? It's not going to affect your rights to get your uh, paid sick leave. And similarly, it's not going to affect your rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we include this slide here to remind you that, say, an employee uses up all of their leave. They use up all their sick leave. They use up all their DCFMLA leave. They use up all their UPLA leave. You may still have an independent obligation to grant leave as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. And so that's something for you to keep in mind. It's another way that uh, the UPLA can interplay with other laws. Okay. So employees who are out on um, long-term disability benefits or out on unemployment insurance are not eligible for UPLA leave. They cannot apply for UPLA leave benefits. Short-term disability benefits are a little different, a little bit more complicated. And I'd like to start by saying, when I say short-term disability benefits, we're really talking about two different types of policies. Some organizations have a short-term disability policy through their carriers, right? And their carrier, their insurance carrier, administers the policy. They make the determinations of whether or not you're covered. They pay out the wage replacement payments. Other organizations just offer a salary continuation while somebody goes out on short-term disability leave. So the interplay is going to be similar but slightly different. For uh, an organization that has a uh, SCD plan through a carrier, those employees are going to be able to apply for short-term disability benefits while they are out on UPLA leave. right? But chances are that your policy is written in such a way that your insurance carrier is going to offset any payments that they get from the D.C. government, from UPLA, against their policy. It's, it's very unlikely. I mean, it's going to depend on the policy, but it's very unlikely that an insurance carrier will allow you to get both their payments and UPLA payments. They're going to probably just pay the difference if there is any. For organizations that have their own policy, their own salary continuation policy, you're going to, you should, uh, you're going to be able to and you should redraft this policy to address UPLA leave specifically. And what I mean by that is you should spell out for employees uh, what can you do when you go out on UPLA leave? Can you apply for short-term disability benefits? And if so, does it offset? And you should be able to write the policy in such a way that it does offset. So you don't have to give them short-term disability benefits on top of uh, their UPLA wage replacement uh, pay uh, payments. Uh, you should also address the gross-up example that I mentioned under the, the paid uh, parental leave example. Mm -hmm. Your policy should say, if you're out on UPLA leave, can you then use your own short-term disability uh, salary continuation policy to gross it up to the 100% of your wages if you're only getting 90% wage replacements from the D.C. government? So you want to think about these uh, situations. You want to make sure that your policy is, addresses all of these situations before you have to deal with uh, those sorts of scenarios as they come up. And I think... Uh, Jen is now going to come up and go through an example that's going to kind of tie all of these interplay scenarios together. Okay, great. So the way we've broken it down is I've got two examples. Um, the first one is going to be for smaller nonprofits that aren't subject to DCFMLA. So you may want to take notes. I'm going to break it down by weeks. And then I have a second example that's going to apply to um, nonprofits that have 20 or more employees and are subject to uh, DCFMLA. So Sally is, is pregnant, and she comes to you, and she says that she is, she's pregnant, and she's going to have a C-section, and she's going to want to take leave. Um, let's assume that Sally doesn't have any medical issues prior to the birth of her child. Um, so she's with a smaller, she's employed by a smaller nonprofit that um, offers UPLA leave and benefits. Um, they are going to plot a uh, offer at a minimum three days of paid sick leave under the D.C. accrued Safe and Sick Leave Act. Most, most offer more, but they're under 25 employees, so it's got to be at least three. 
Um, they also have a short-term disability policy that provides for a hundred percent of salary for eight weeks to birth mothers who have a C-section, or just let's just say all, all birth mothers. Um, the Policy, the employer also has a paid parental leave policy that provides six weeks of paid leave to, and for birth mothers, that paid parental leave begins at the exhaustion of the short-term disability benefits. Okay, so we've got four benefits we're dealing, and this is just for an employer who has less than 20 employees. Um, so again, no complications prior to pregnancy, uh, leave begins on the day of the birth. So week one, we're going to assume right now, and the regulations are gonna clarify that the UPLA leave begins on day one. Um, and it's gonna continue for that week. But remember, we're not, but benefits aren't gonna start until after the seven day waiting period, the seven day elimination period. We're assuming that's the way it's gonna work. Um, similarly, the short term disability policy also has a seven day waiting period. So for week one, Sally's on UPLA leave, but how's she getting paid? There you go. Yay, Dan. Uh, <laughs> paid sick leave, right? Or she can use PTO. And you can use, and you can amend your policies to reflect this, or even internally have procedures in place so this is really clear. Um, so now we're going to move on to weeks two through eight. Um, Sally is on UPLA leave and receiving UPLA benefits from the DC government. Um, pursuant to the employer's short term disability plan, she is getting 100% of her salary minus any benefits she's receiving from the DC government under the UPLA. Why? Because her employer attended this presentation and amended their policies to reflect that Sally's not going to double dip and get 100% of her salary plus everything she's entitled to under UPLA. Um, again, that's for weeks two through eight. At the End of week eight, so we've got UPLA leave exhausted, UPLA benefits exhausted. We have short-term disability benefits exhausted, but Sally's not finished yet. Why? Because we have paid parental leave that our policy says begins for birth mothers following exhaustion of short-term disability benefits. So for weeks nine through 14, that's your six weeks of paid parental leave. Um, and then after 14 weeks, she's exhausted the paid parental leave. Maybe Sally has some additional paid time off that she wants to take, and she can use that after week 14. Okay. So what if it's an association that is subject to DCFMLA, has 20 or more employees in DC, and out, Sally is, meets the eligibility requirements. I'm not going to put federal on top of this because as I was drafting this, I'm like, I'm gonna like make everybody's head really spin around. So again, nonprofit, less than 50 employees, but more than 20 or more employees in DC. Provides UPLA benefits, DC FMLA leave, so that's 16 weeks medical, 16 weeks family. Got to start with that. You got DC paid sick leave. That's going to be a minimum of seven to 10 days, depending on the size of the employee. No, yeah, five days. Um, so it'll be at least five days. The short term disability policy that the association provides um, allows for 80% of salary. Um, this is, in Carl's example, um, it's, a, it's through a carrier, and the carrier says, we're going to offset any benefits, uh, any other types of income that, they, that the employee receives during short-term disability. So, there, so Sally's not going to be receiving 80% of her salary plus everything under UPLA. Um, and then they all, the association also provides that paid parental leave policy. I'm going to stick with the six weeks just to try to keep it simple. Again, Sally has a C-section, no medical issues prior to birth. The leave begins on the day of the birth of the child. So we're week one, um, we've got UPLA parental leave beginning. 
DCFMLA parental leave beginning. We don't have short-term disability or UPLA benefits be beginning yet, right? Because we got the seven day waiting period for both. So she's gonna use DC sick leave during week one. Then we're going to go to week two through eight. Um, she is going to continue to exhaust her UPLA leave, um, parental leave, and she's also going to be using her 16, or part of her 16 week entitlement of DC medical leave. Why? Because she's recovering for the birth of a child, right? It's not the bonding time yet. So during that time, this is weeks two through eight, she's gonna receive that 80% salary, but she's not gonna be able to gross up pursuant to your carrier's policies. End of week eight, what do we have? We've got UPLA leave exhausted, UPLA benefits exhausted, STD, short term disability benefits are exhausted, but what's left? She still has eight weeks of her DC FMLA medical leave entitlement remaining. So that's still out there, eight weeks. At the end of week eight, she's no longer recovering from the birth of her child. So what starts up? DC FMLA family leave for bonding with the child. So weeks nine through 14, she's going to start taking the paid parental leave which she's entitled to, which runs, which you as the employer being at our presentation is going to make sure runs concurrent with DC FMLA. So she's going to take the six weeks of paid parental leave as well. And that's going to count toward her entitlement toward DC FMLA family leave. So that's weeks nine through 14. At the end of week 14, her paid parental leave benefits are exhausted because it was only six weeks, but what still remains? 10 weeks of family leave under DC FMLA. So she can tack on for weeks 14 through 24, she can take DC FMLA family leave and apply to that if she chooses any PTO, right? Any paid time off that she has. She can't use sick leave, but she can use vacation. After week 24, DC FMLA family leave is exhausted. But remember what I say, Sally still has eight weeks of medical leave left. And she can still use that in a 24 month period in the 24 month period. So those are the two examples. And I don't know, maybe some of you have questions. Again, we can save it to the end. But I do want to go ahead and just touch on now. I think, I think we're OK for time. Um, I'm going to touch on penalties for noncompliance, as, as Carl touched on earlier. So similar to DCFMLA, when there's certain circumstances um, giving rise to notice, you as the employer are, have to say, OK, well, they're, they're sick. They may need UPLA leave. You have to pro provide them a notice. If you don't, um, $100 civil penalty. Similarly, there is a penalty for failing to post in a conspicuous place. Um, if you fail to contribute to the fund when you should be, meaning you have that one employee who works 50% or more of their time in DC, you're going to be subject to the same financial penalties and interest as if you failed to contribute to the DC unemployment insurance fund. There are, in case you were concerned, there are additional non penalties for noncompliance. Um, it's interesting, this law actually gives an employee standing to bring an, an action against the employer. Civil lawsuits by eligible employees, um, or it can be brought by the DC Attorney General or even the mayor. Um, damages are, are fairly significant here. I mean, it's the greater of back pay and related damages or consequential damages of up to three times the amount of back pay and related damages. That can be really significant. Um, and then of course, reasonable attorney's fees and costs. Okay, so ways to prepare. Oops, missed that. Um, so again, you got plenty of time, right? You're going to maybe be revising handbooks at the end of this year, beginning of next year, plenty of time to deal with all your leave policies and, and figure that out. Um, but that payroll tax is going to be coming up starting July 1st of this year. Are you ready to administer the tax? Do you have the proper procedures in place for that? Um, 
I mean, look at the financial implications. How is this going to affect your bottom line? What does it mean for the organization? And also, again, do you have those proper record-keeping procedures in place to make sure you're doing things properly and have that proof that you're required to have? Um, again, the, the leave is going to, the employee's ability to take advantage of the UPLA leave and the benefits isn't going to start until July 1st of 2020. But within the next, you know, 18 months or so, definitely take a look at your, your leave policies and figure out, maybe you want to keep them the way that, that they are, and, and that's fine. Um, but some employers may want to say, maybe we're going to pull back on these policies a little bit. Maybe we want to avoid kind of what I call double dipping. Um, and then you also, at the same time, want to try to think about, and it's, this is probably easier for Carl and I to stand up here and say this, uh, you know, take a look at your staff. How are you going to deal with employees being out for these periods of time, particularly if you're a smaller employer? Um, again, hoping that the regulations provide some relief on the intermittent issue, particularly with regard to the, um, the smaller employers, because I think that's going to be um, really difficult. Um, and then, again, as we move forward and employees start to actually use the UPLA and receive the benefits, we just need to train our managers. Um, just let them know we, we can't discipline, as, as Carl had mentioned earlier, we, we can't discipline, we can't fire, we can't not give them a promotion because we're upset that they took advantage of their legal entitlement to take eight weeks in a 52-week period for these benefits. Um, and then finally, and I'm actually really on the edge of my seat, I'm really anticipating these leave regulations because I would love some clarity um, in order to be able to um, advise everyone on, on how to best implement um, this law as it, come, as it moves forward. All right, so with that, I'm going to, um, so I want to do a little commercial for our next presentation before we get to questions. Um, next nonprofit program is going to be on May 23rd. Um, Eric Berman and Alicia O'Brien are going to be discussing state attorney general and congressional investigations, specific, specifically the investigator and investigated perspectives. Um, and also, I did recognize some of the names on the list. So if I've talked to you over the phone several times but never had the opportunity to meet you in person, please come up and say hi at the end. I'd appreciate it. So we're going to go ahead and take questions then.